AI is a whole of society issues. Yes, the ministry will provide a framework, but I'm hoping every individual facet, if you're business, if you're a small or medium enterprise, that you will start to harness artificial intelligence to drive value for your specific sector. My name is Ambassador Philip Thigo. Um, His Excellency, the President Special Envoy. The Special Envoy's role, as you know, is, is very much around creating a specific focus on, on a specific subject matter. I'm the second envoy. I came from Kibera. <laughs> I actually grew up in Olympic, uh, just down the street. Um, studied in Kenya, went abroad, um, worked extensively uh, outside the country uh, from civil society, was a funder, lived in the Arab world for about eight years. Uh, I speak Arabic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and English. I worked a lot uh, and a little bit of French. Work a lot with young people. I've, I've been very much part of, of, of the tech ecosystem. Uh, been informed by it, grown by it. Uh, from the early days of 2008, 2009, with the Shahidi and crisis management up to now, um, transitioned into a startup, <laughs> like every Kenyan trying to do a hustle. Uh, but then I realized there's a lot that needs to be done from the public sector side. So. Part of me being me is, is, is to focus on how we can build capacity of public sector to support the innovation ecosystem. What do you consider your biggest achievements in this space? I think it's never an individual achievement. I always tell people. Uh, I think it's only sometimes it's fortunate for some of us who get recognized, but I think we don't see many people who are behind the scenes who actually make a lot of these things happen. We were able to work with like-minded countries, uh, to enact the first ever artificial intelligence United Nations resolution that talks about a safe, inclusive, trustworthy AI. And it is the only one that is inclusive of every country in the world. The other piece, of course, is, uh, is for the first time Kenya is part of an international network of AI safety institutes. Uh, we, were, we are not a creator of AI, or neither do we own the big infrastructure, but we are part of ensuring that AI is safe and, and secure in a way that then can deliver value. Um, the other piece, of course, is through our mission in New York, uh, we were able to steer um, the negotiations on AI in the Global Digital Compact. That's a big deal, uh, because we were steering it on behalf of, of the Group of 77 and China. And again, that particular Global Digital Compact was enacted or was, was, was sort of um, developed through a consensus. Mm. And, and I think that that has really been the spirit of Kenya. How do we ensure that we have consensus in a lot of things that we do? Looking at, the, at Kenya currently, most of the crucial services are moving online. We have, there's a lot of campaign about e-citizen onboarding everyone on e-citizen. Is the government of Kenya keen on inclusion of all people online? How can um, people with, uh, with disabilities be able to access these platforms on their own? So I think if, if you think about the very notion that it is digital, that also means inclusivity, right? Because before you had to travel uh, a couple of kilometers just to get a service, because now you can access it via a device. I think for me that speaks about inclusivity. If you look at the citizen, part of it again has accessibility opportunities for persons with disability, but it does not necessarily cover the whole range of disabilities. Uh, part of my portfolio, and I work very closely with, uh, with, a, with a group that works on assistive technologies, mm -hmm. is to actually look at this. Is how do you ensure that you work with persons with disabilities on developing assistive technologies? And there's now an assistive technologies SDG lab here that I was part of inaugurating a couple of months ago. People accessing services in their own language is important because Part of it also is cultural preservation. You also need people to understand to call things, things in their own language and culture. What we are trying to work on now is, is audio and voice mm -hmm. translation so that you can be able to speak to a service and it's able to translate back to you without necessarily any human intervention. This is what we call training. Mm -hmm. So that is what is, I, I think we're doing now. So next year you'll start to see a lot of this. What does the future of connectivity in Kenya look like? Will it be... Uh, fiber or satellites are more likely to work well. <laughs> well, I mean, my own view, honestly, it's a mix. It's the same way energy is an energy mix, right? So there's geothermal, there's hydro, there's solar. You actually have to provide a mix. And, and the thing about a mix is you give people options. Uh, right now, connectivity in this region, not, not just Kenya, is about 24%. 
Kenya boosts the region because connectivity in Kenya is about 42%, right? And that has been progressive based on investments. These investments are not cheap, right? So think about Kenya is potentially the only country with about five or six fiber cables that are coming in from 2008 uh, on the days of PSN demo up to now. And so there had to be that mix of let's get fiber, okay? Then once we get fiber, let's get in-country fiber <laughs> so that you can at least connect the counties then let's get a satellite to where it's hard to bring in kind of physical infrastructure. Now you've seen Starlink coming, yeah. providing another satellite option. So it will be a mix. I think my sense is that what we need to do and what the president has been amazing doing is providing opportunities for private sector to come in and, and provide services, especially where government in most cases cannot necessarily provide the last mile. If you go, for example, I've seen also, in, if, if you go to Eastlands, the private sector companies providing sort of base stations yeah. and providing very specific niche connectivity for content providers. Mm -hmm. So I think for me, that's the future of connectivity. It's just not, it won't be general connectivity. It will be very much purpose-driven connectivity, including schools, markets. So it will be connectivity for something. And I think that's important because now, if you look at the data, a lot of the connectivity usage, you know, you, I can connect you, but yeah. then what am I using it for? Yeah. It's for chatting. Yeah. Right? So our productivity is still very low. So I think for me, the future is to flip it. Mm -hmm. Just don't provide general connectivity. Mm -hmm. Provide connectivity, but for something. We must drive use in a way that builds mm -hmm. or creates economic activity, mm -hmm. not just connectivity yes. for connectivity's sake. Ambassador, you are part of the UN Secretary General's <laughs> advisory body on AI, and I've read the report quite mm. extensively. What steps is Kenya taking in AI governance? I think AI is a whole of society issues. Yes, the ministry will provide a framework, but I'm hoping every individual facet if you're business, if you're a small and medium enterprise, that you will start to harness artificial intelligence to drive value for your specific sector. Uh, because we, where the world is moving right now is that if you're not engaging in these new emerging technologies, then chances are that you'll not even be able to catch up in future. Yeah. And so part of what the UN advisory body report speaks about, it speaks about opportunities, speaks about enablers also speaks about the cost of misuse mm -hmm. that if you don't use AI this is what is potentially gonna happen so there's a fascination with these new things it, it looks shiny yeah. but then we should not forget the foundations and fundamentals right so the data aspects of it are we producing data in open standards and format and protecting it in a way that it can be used safely to drive innovation right whether it's in food health climate um, education there's a lot of geopolitics on, on artificial intelligence. And I think that's why uh, having tech and voice is important because a lot of these things are negotiations. Nobody seeds power, right? A AI is, 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 is the next nuclear. There has to be a negotiation around how do we collaborate based on the capability of compute so that I can leverage in a compute so that I can process my data. And in the same way, we find some value to exchange the data in a way that is safe. Uh, um, the second part is we, we must start to talk about sovereign AI. Right? And that's something that I'm working on right now. And so for now, it doesn't mean that we are closing ourselves. <laughs> it just means that we must figure out how artificial intelligence works for the country. The future, in my view, in terms of the future of power on Gen AI, would be how best have we, able to, have, we, have we been able to collaborate in a way that speaks to our sovereignty, but still contribute to a larger uh, global goal or global public good. We need to move towards that new kind of um, regime where education sees AI as an accelerator uh, and a supporter to deliver some of these uh, educational outcomes, but also uh, ensure that we're future ready uh, workforce that can compete globally. Because for me, that being competing globally is the most important thing. Speaking of the workforce, here we are. <laughs> <laughs> Many Kenyans today work online and and from monetization of content. And for those working for online, some of the times they are inhibited by geographical um, mm. challenges in that there are some jobs you can't do unless you have to put a VPN mm. to, a VPN to say that you're in the Netherlands while in real sense you're <laughs> in Kiamaiko. <laughs> so, <laughs> 
what are some of the policies? Is it um, is it governance? What is it that just can bridge this geographical divide in the labor force now? I have a sense that work always technology always moves ahead of policy or moves ahead of uh, of, of sort of those agreements or collaborations. I think the sense that I have, and this is something potentially we'll, we'll be doing next year in the coming years, is think about how do we reimagine uh, this this sort of labor agreements? Mm -hmm. uh, because not many are online or, or, or tech related. If we consider online work as, 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 as a sector where we want to export our labor, you can also export your labor virtually, mm -hmm. then I think we need to start engaging uh, countries in, in, in a conversation around labor agreements that also speaks about online work. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying this also especially because one is people only seeing the benefits of it, but there are potential harms of it, right, in terms of exploitation. You can also be exploited online. The, the, there could also be risks around the content you're viewing, around, you know, psychological issues that people are, 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 are sort of facing. So how do you ensure that, that, that you're protecting a Kenyan who's working online? Are there legislations currently that guide such issues? You can legislate in Kenya, but a lot of these harms are not physically here. Mm -hmm. So for me, the legal pathway is always the last resort in my view. Mm -hmm. We need to have a cadence of a collaboration between big tech companies and ourselves. You know, one is because we have to coexist. Secondly is that they need to make money, and in their making money, we need our folks employed. So there's, there's definitely a transactional issue here. So my approach has been always engaging uh, with the big tech companies. And it's, it's people at the end of the, people just see the logos. Believe me, there are human beings there who understand. And in most cases, they don't have the context. So sometimes when you start to engage, they start, oh, okay, we get it. Right? Because then a lot of also these, these sort of issues you're hearing, they're always through intermediaries. It's never directly with the big tech companies. So sometimes I prefer to engage with the big tech companies uh, that we can start to, to have a, a good conversation of if this is the future of work, how do we ensure that we start to, to, to create guardrails? And I go on guardrails mostly for me because it's changing very quickly. You, you legislate today, tomorrow <laughs> it becomes something else. You legislate today, then it becomes a jurisdictional issue, right? So it doesn't apply to you. Think about technology as an aspect, uh, as, a, as an artifact to improve lives. That's how I see it. If, if technology can, can be leveraged or harnessed to continually improve people's lives, I think for me that, that needs to be the imagined future that we want to go to. I frame it in four ways. If you look at, I'm currently working on my strategy, is I look at how do we build a safe, secure, inclusive, and trustworthy digital future. That for me is it.